Hey everybody, it's Coach Bill Hart. Welcome to All In with Coach Bill Hart. It is my pleasure to introduce you to my friend, Mike Morrison in Boise, Idaho. The great thing about Mike is that he's been in the business like 19 years, but he's gonna tell a story in the beginning of the interview about how about nine years ago, he was making 50% more calls than everybody else in the refi shop that he was working for. And for the, the, the three different companies that he worked for in that genre, he was always the number one salesperson. So he cut his teeth there. Then he transitioned into a purchase market. And I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to tell the story cause you're going to hear it, but the, the essence of it is this guy has built a business based on follow-up that is absolutely inspirational. It's something you and I can both learn from. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Mike Morrison. How are you, brother? Doing great, Coach Bill. How are you? I'm so good, buddy. We were just talking before I hit record about uh, the fact that you spoke at Todd Duncan's Sales Mastery event a few months ago in Palm Springs, Palm Desert, technically, for those in the know. Uh, but you fly into Palm Springs, so there you go. The greater Palm Springs area. And I don't know, man, you know, the numbers vary, but there were twelve to 1,600 people in the audience, something like that. It's a big deal for a guy who doesn't do that to have that opportunity. And you did such a great job, man. And your talk was called Fortune is in the Follow-Up, which is largely what we're going to talk about today. And so I was just asking you about reflecting on it and so on and so forth. And and so that you guys all know, like Mike basically, literally memorized a 10-minute talk. I don't know how many of you have tried to do that, but that's not the easiest thing in the world to do. Mm. But he was kind of fitting into Todd's structure and did a great job. And man, you got great feedback and and I was just so proud of you to be able to sit in the audience and listen to you do that thing. So, buddy, I, I want you to lay the framework out a little bit for people here because the people that don't know you, people inside our organization at Movement know you and they probably know of your volume and what you've done. But there's an awful lot of people that are going to listen to this and watch this that don't know. So just tell people quickly, like, how long have you been in the business and give them relevant volume numbers. And by relevant, I mean last year, which was a different world. And mm-hmm. then, you know, what it's going to look like this year. Uh, so, yeah, I've been in the yeah, business for uh, just over 19 years. Started in late 2003. So a long time. Uh, seen a few things. Started in California. Made my way to Idaho, uh, which is where I am. I've been here the last 13 years. Uh, love Idaho. Great place if anybody's looking for a change. My mortgage career in Idaho became part of a refinance uh, boom, basically, from 2010 to 2014. Uh, that was mm-hmm. that was kind of where I became ca- kind of the modern version of what I am right now. That trained me in a lot of uh, lot of skills and things at that time. The rates, if everybody remembers, the rates kind of went up in 2014, started uh, started going up and that kind of went away. And that's when I made the shift to purchase business. So I really, really became, uh, you know, realtor focused purchase uh, LO in, in 2015 and, uh, and had to change my business at that point because it yeah. just didn't fit into the refinance model that we had back then. Been successful and just have basically uh, grown the business every year, you know, since then. 2018, um, I think I did like 50 something million, I think in uh, 2019, I did 75-ish, somewhere around there. And then 2020 and 2021 were just, I mean, eye-opening. I mean, it's nothing I would have ever dreamed of. Uh, 116 and then 174. Wow. Um, yeah. I mean, just just truly amazing. And then this year has been a challenge. Uh, yeah. No doubt about it. A lot of people have asked me about that. Um, it's been it's been a different year and uh, we'll finish probably somewhere in the 90-ish range uh, there. But I, I'm looking forward to 2023 and I think there's a lot of good things ahead. So. Yeah, agreed, man. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations on a on a great 2022, right? Because yeah. that's that's it's just been a completely different day it's a, you, yeah. you know you've i mean you you tell me you talk to more people i don't want to put words in your mouth but if there was a general sort of narrative from people that are not in our industry mm-hmm. and maybe they're getting their news from the national news which is obviously going to be more prone to the you know all the horrible things that are happening right yeah. like what what's the general message that you hear back from the public these days uh, you know i i think there's a lot of caution uh, yep. A lot of caution from potential buyers. Speaking specifically to my market here in Idaho, we've had our home prices go up pretty substantially over the last three, four, five years, and you know, and you pair that with rates, and and you know, a lot of a lot of the local incomes have been outpaced right now. So there's a lot of caution. A lot of people that feel like they can't afford it. Um, a lot of uh, everybody just remembers the recession from 2008 and the home prices going down. So everybody kind of thinks that's going to happen again. Right. 
there are so many reasons why I don't believe that is going to I happen. Totally agree, uh, man. And we yeah. probably don't have enough time to get into all of that. But yeah. I'm a firm believer that that was an anomaly and not something that's going to occur oh, this my time. Yes. So, you know, just a lot of caution, a lot of kind of fence sitting, people that are kind of taking their time, being cautious. You know, so we're doing our best to try to show people why buying a home is still a great opportunity. You know, it's funny, you know, the, the market, you know, really plummeted back in 06, 07, 08, 09, 010. And that time, it would have been very difficult to choose to buy a home, right? In 2011, you, you would have been a home buyer and said, hey, you know, should I buy a home right now? I've just seen these, the, everything just come crashing down. But in hindsight, if you had bought a home back then, you would have fared very, very well. And I wish I could do 2010 to 2012 over again oh, and buy 100 right, houses man. back then. Right? Right? Likewise. But while you're in that moment, it's very hard to see that, right? It Hindsight is. is 2020, as we say. Yeah. And I think that's I think that's what homeowners need to know right now, right? Is is it looks challenging right now, but if you find the home, if you find a great place for your for you and your family. Home ownership is just far, it's infinitely better than renting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just infinitely better than renting. And no so doubt, sometimes no. it just takes, yeah, you just have the got to have the courage to pull the trigger. That's right. Well, and, and, you know, for this audience, primarily loan officers, there's a few yeah. realtors that pay attention to it as well. But it's, it's about what you just said. And then it's one le level back, which is our responsibility, I believe, to educate, right? Mm -hmm. We need to educate the public because truly, if you just listen to the national news, it's just going to tell you that it's a glimpse of a moving train, but it's not the whole big picture, right? If you yeah. pan back and look at the big picture, it's like, oh, okay, yeah. I see where we are right now. And as you pointed out, the contrarians in investing in general are the ones that always say, you know, yeah. lean in when others are running away. So anyway, with all that said, you, you've you really built something special, bud. And I really don't recall this, so I'm going to ask this question without yeah. knowing the answer. But your database, I know we've had this conversation mm -hmm. before and you may not know the exact number, but but maybe you do it these days. I don't know, man. How many people are in your database? In terms of like past clients that I've helped? Well, not just past clients, but any just anybody, yeah, that's in your database. Those could be realtors or prospects or TBDs, prequels that move forward. I do need to get a new accounting of that, but it's it's got to be five to 10,000 if you yeah. take the entire, uh, you know, leads, past clients, agents, it's, yep. it's multiple thousands. Yeah. So the reason that I asked that is because I know what a great job you do with follow-up. So the, you know, that's kind of where we're heading thematically, right. In, in terms mm -hmm. of our conversation, but I think I've said to you before, Mike, you know, if you and I were in a room with a hundred loan originators, just average loan originators, mm -hmm. and I asked them how many people are in your database, the vast majority of them will tell me two to 300. That's what I hear most often. And it's usually because those are, it's what you just did initially. You said, do you mean past borrowers? Because that's where our mind goes, right? Mm -hmm. Like my database of past borrowers. But when you say five to 10,000, that's what I hear from top producers everywhere is they, they've got these massive numbers and it's because they never let go of anybody. So at mm -hmm. some point, I don't know if it was when you were in the refi focus or it was when you just transitioned out of that. But at what point did you realize, mm, yeah, don't want to let go of these contacts because I want to be able to feed and water these relationships, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was in that refi time frame. And that's kind of why I like to mention that, um, you know, it was just it was where I I learned the business prior in uh, in California in the in the previous boom before the meltdown. But when I came to Idaho and started in the refinance world, you know, there was a couple of things that made you successful there. One is uh, these were companies that, you know, essentially advertised out and the phone would ring. And right. so one of the first things that made you successful was just trying to answer the phone before anybody else. It was literally just grab the phone as quickly as you can. Yeah. And now you, now you have an opportunity. And so I would uh, definitely put my effort into that. I would put in longer hours and uh, I would be ready. I would be ready to go. Uh, but the second thing uh, that I think really helped me stand out at that point was uh, that I didn't just take a call and sort of accept the first conversation or the first answer that I got. I went after people. I did not give up, right? If they, if they had an objection, I continued to follow up. I just like a bulldog. I mean, I just went after it and went after it, went after it. And I just learned that, um, you know, that you don't always get the answer that you want in the first call or two. It mm. just, it just isn't what happens. And so there was just a tremendous benefit for me to just stay after it. And, and rather than sit around and check Facebook or look at my phone or have a conversation by the water cooler or have a long lunch, 
I just kept calling. Uh, I just kept calling. And, and so, you know, during that time frame, 2010 to 2014, I probably worked for, I would say maybe three different companies, a couple, you know, it was kind of a, these companies were kind of fly by night. Uh, and, oh, uh, I remember them well. Yeah. yeah. And so what I was proud of is that at, at every one of those companies, I eventually rose to the number one salesperson at each right one. On. You know, I didn't really recognize it in the moment. Uh, you know, there wasn't anything that stood out to me as to why this was happening. But I remember at one point, one of the managers came out and I, I didn't even know he could do this, but he had some phone metrics uh, that he could he could kind of check the whole offices, how, how we dialed, what we were doing during yeah. the day. And he could listen in on calls and things like that. But at one point, it was after a couple of years, right? And I was I was doing well and kind of outpacing a lot of the other salespeople. He came out and he kind of brought everybody together. And he was a little he was kind of angry uh, at the at that point. And uh, he brought out some stats, and it and it turned out that I was just essentially making like fifty percent more calls than anybody in the office. Wow. I mean, and that's all it was. So I'd love to tell you that I'm good at this, that I'm skilled, that I'm a people person, and that I'm a smooth talker. I'd love to say all that, but no, it's just simply that I outworked people. I want your last words to just sink in with people that, you know, I wasn't the smoothest talker. It wasn't all about that. It was about just being willing to outwork people. I want to get to the why of that though, Mike. And I don't know that you and I've talked about that because that, you know, there's a couple of ways that that could be described. I think in my experience, Mm -hmm. one is I need the money and you're the route to more money. So I'm just going to stay in touch with you until you wear down and we're going to make money. Another way would be that you see something that they don't. And my guess is it might've been a combination of the two, but when, you know, when I talk about you see something that they don't in the moment, right? Let that very person that's hunkering down right now saying, you know what? I think I'm, I think I'm just going to rent. I think it's the safest play. Mm -hmm. You see something very different. I know you do. You, and as do I, and that is, yeah, that's a mistake. I mean, worst case, let's say rates stay at seven and let's look at, this is the presentation Barry Habib just did for us, right? But mm-hmm. let's say rates stay at seven and we we assume a, I think a 30 year average in national appreciation was four and a half percent, something like that, mm-hmm. very conservative. If you compare that to rents going up on average 6% every year, like it's inarguable that mm-hmm. that purchasing is the better deal. So going back to that time, that whatever that, what, did you say 2010 to 2014? 14, yeah. yeah. So in that window, like what was it that, what caused you to outwork them? I mean, were you this kid when you played football, when you played piano, when you did homework? No. Yeah. Well, I, I yeah. I really don't know where this came from, actually. Nice. Um, I was not particularly good or skilled at, at things when I was younger. I wasn't an athlete. I love sports. I love watching and playing sports, but I, I was always small. I never did anything s- special in that in that way. I was smart. Uh, you know, I was I was pretty smart, but I didn't particularly apply myself to anything. I kind of coasted yeah. through things all the way through college. Uh, but to answer your question, there's three things. I just want to remember to hit these. So there's the money, yeah. uh, there's uh, competitive, being competitive, and there's opportunity. So with the money, I, I definitely like the money, right? Yeah. This 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 job, I've made more money in, in just the last two years than I would have ever dreamed possible, right? Oh, and, sure. and I love that aspect of it. But I'm very happy to say I don't do it for the money. Nice. I, I wouldn't. I don't think I would do it without the money, which is a little yeah, different no, I understood. I do it for the money. And I'm very happy to say that I've never, never throughout my entire career looked at a loan and said, I need this to close because I need that check. Right. That's never right. been that's never been a position I've put myself in. So so I love the financial part. And, and that's definitely a driver. But it, it really isn't the, the number one thing, even nice. though it's a huge part of it. I'm very competitive. I'm competitive at board games. I'm competitive when I do play sports. It drives my wife nuts that I can't take a, you know, a, a recreational kickball league. Uh, you know, right. uh, I take it too seriously, you know, stuff like that. So I'm very competitive. I want to get to the top of the leaderboard. I want to outperform my peers. And so that's a very important thing. That's that might be be the number one thing is that just makes see, sense like, to me yeah like why can't i do this better you know so i'm always driving that way but you know the other thing though is you know when those people are calling in 2010 to 2014 and they're talking about refinancing and they don't want to do it or whatever i would put my mind in a frame of reference where i see the opportunity for them and and you combine the opportunity that i see with the fact that i'm competitive and i don't want to give up on that opportunity for them oh yeah so I would just routinely show them the positives. And this is not a hard sell. I'm not a hard sales guy, sure. but this is just like, like just continually laying out here are the positives based on what you've told me and what your situation is. 
These are the positives for you. The next call might be a completely different set of positives, right? You have to break down each situation by asking smart questions, taking notes, and then continuing to not let them give up on what they want to do. Nice. That's so good, bud. Yeah. I I love this so much. And it reminds me, you're going to laugh, but I'm not kidding. It reminds me of when I was trying to win my wife, Tony's heart. Yeah. Like, like seriously, I took the, I'm competitive and I saw an opportunity, right? Uh Like I, I could see our future before she did. Yeah. Right? So yeah. in the same way, man, I was just coming at it from different angles and doing whatever I could. So I'll bet yeah. you did something similar because you also married over your head. Congratulations, yeah. by the way. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. But I love that answer, buddy. I love that answer. And I just think for right for right now, if you're a loan officer and you just heard Mike, you know, d- just describe his mindset, that's something I would challenge you to do a quick gut check on. Like, like where do you fall in terms of your competitiveness? Where do you fall in terms of your ability to see the opportunity for that borrower, that client, that realtor, that that individual that you're talking to that they may not see? Because look, here's what they, well, you tell me, Mike, what have they been trained to ask? Somebody that knows nothing about the mortgage industry, they've been referred to you. What have they been trained to ask? What's your rate? Yeah. It's like, okay, come on, this is silly. And so there's a million different ways to deal with that. I think I probably told you my favorite was the... The, the Texan with the big belt buckle that, you know, when we were talking about this in a big room in Dallas and mm-hmm. he pushed his cowboy hat back and he said, well, I understand that question. And here's the thing. I'm sorry for all you Texans listening right now. <laughs> I can get you 0%. It's going to require a hundred percent down. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's the greatest line ever, right? Cause it, it completely just moves it off of the face of the, mm-hmm. of the, of the table. And it's like, let's have, let's just have a conversation. Mm-hmm. I can throw a number at you, but it doesn't mean anything until I know something about you. So to that point, I don't want to run past this without asking you that question. What do you have sort of a go-to response there when somebody starts with that question? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I mean, I typically kind of deflect it a little bit, honestly, um, you know, because that is not typically the most important aspect of the transaction. So, you know, a typical response to that might be, you know, hey, interest rates, you know, they vary quite a bit based on your scenario and situation. And so I need to know more about you before I give you an interest rate. Nice. Uh, when I give that to you, I want to be able to stand behind it. Uh, oh, that's you know, good. Yeah. And, and, and I, another thing I like to tell the client is I would be very wary of somebody that wants to immediately give you their rate without any details about you because they're taking no accountability for that number. So not, no accountability, right? They're not standing behind it at all, right? They could tell you that right now if they said, hey, your rate's going to be 5%. Well, that sounds fantastic. But what are they basing that on? Right. You know, so yeah. and if somebody wants to give you that number that quickly, that's their that's their only thing. And then they're going to change that and they're going to have a list of reasons why it doesn't apply anymore. Yeah. So good, man. Yeah. yeah. And you probably got, you know, hundreds of stories of people that chased that and mm-hmm. then came back to you later because either the Absolutely. rate was higher or they had to bring more to the closing table or Absolutely. whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right, buddy, let's get to the follow-up side because this this is the thing that you spoke about in front of, you know, a thousand loan officers. And dude, I was watching them leaning forward, making notes. I don't know if you could tell because the lights are in your face, yeah. but like they were making notes. So it was pretty cool. Todd standing next to you, Linda Davidson on the other side, they're listening. It was just, you had that audience. So it, it, if, if you were going to synopsize sort of the message that you brought to that group right now about follow-up, what, how would you encapsulate your message for this group? Yeah, I mean, basically that there are a lot of opportunities out there for us. And I think uh, as an industry, and this applies to realtors as well. So great message to deliver to your partners. Um, You know, we just give up too soon. People, you know, they, they make an initial internet inquiry or they ask an agent some questions at an open house and we make a call or we send an email and, and then that's it. We give up on it. Yep. That person has an interest. It may, it may not be this week. It may not be next week, but it might be in a month or it might be in a year. And at the base level, I believe our jobs are to just quite simply stay top of mind. That's a, that's a phrase I've used for many, many years. All we have to do is to stay top of mind. If you're a loan officer, you have to stay top of mind with the, the clients and with the agents. And with your database, and if you're a, with a realtor, it's really the same, you know, the same group of people. So, you know, if we stay top of mind, then whenever that person decides it's the right time, they're going to contact us. So, Mike, let me just interrupt you there yeah. real quick. There's a school of thought. Let's let's mm-hmm. do that. That says, I'm going to stay top of mind with like blueberry recipes, blueberry muffin recipes. 
Mm -hmm. And my belief is that's nonsense. Like, Mm -hmm. stop that. That's not, if you're a baker, fine. Like, Mm -hmm. you do that. If you sell muffins, cool. Mm -hmm. But that's not who you are. So so Mm -hmm. just give us a quick example, and I want you to come right back to it. Forgive me for interrupting. But when you speak of being top of mind, Give us some examples of how you do that. Right now, if a client reached out, we have a conversation, I'm going to take some notes. I'm going to get some details, you know, as much as I can in that initial conversation. And then we're just going to put them on a follow-up schedule to to stay in touch. I might get a, a lead from an agent and they say, okay, I'm not, not quite ready to buy. We're going through Thanksgiving, that kind of thing. Okay, great. Perfect. I might just schedule a quick follow-up for early December. Check back in. You're setting the expectation that you're going to yeah. be following up. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. Absolutely. Based on what they're telling me and based on uh, based on the, how those conversations go, we're just going to anticipate future needs. For example, maybe it's a self-employed person and they, they're they hitting the end of their second year. So they're going to file a, a self-employed tax return for the second time. As loan officers know, that's a key metric for us, right? And whether we can help them or not. You bet. That to me is not a give up. Okay, they don't have two tax returns. I'm just going to give up. They're not qualified right now. No, that's, that's a, absolutely an opportunity to reach out to them in early 2023 and guide them on filing their next tax return and making sure it does what they need to qualify for the next year, right? Like that's a gold so mine good, right man. there. You know, I think many loan officers, we talk to that person in June or July or August and we say, ah, they're, they're six, eight, 10 months out before they can file that return. Yeah. This is no good for me. I don't look at it that way. I look at it as I can have one or two, one, two, three, nice, soft, easy touches, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, a minute and a half. And I can secure that client when they do file their tax return, rather than having them contact a completely different loan officer at that time. So good, buddy. I, you know, I think back to that market that you described when you were doing refis and, and there were so many shops that were set up strictly for refis, right? Mm -hmm. So they would send out mailers, they would tee up phone calls, inbound calls, outbound calls, whatever you had to do, but it was about the refi. And I picture it almost like like going into a supermarket like everybody's doing right now as we record this is just yeah. before Thanksgiving. And and looking for the items that you need. I need this, you know, turkey broth and I need these green beans. And I but you know, in real estate, there, there's been a term that's been around for I don't know, man, 50 years called farming, right? And farming mm-hmm. is a realtor gets a geographic market area and they plant seeds. And mm-hmm. they water them and they pull out the weeds and they scare mm-hmm. the birds away and then they harvest, right? Mm-hmm. Because they have a, a farm. In a very real sense, you took you you bought seeds. Let's let, mm-hmm. let me just go crazy with this for a minute. You bought seeds back in the refi market, and then you learned to create your own farm. It may not be a geographic farm. I mean, I know mm-hmm. largely it is because it's Boise, but it's really just a group of people that you enter into a dialogue with them at some point in their journey, Mm -hmm. then you set them on a follow-up path, which has a variety of different reminders that pop up in your calendar every day. And so I just, I see what I see, Mike, I guess clearly as I'm listening to you is your day is very different than the loan officer that did, you know, I I tend to think units because they're the great equalizer, right? Let's say that the last couple of years, 2021, they were doing five to seven units a month Mm -hmm. and now they're struggling to get two or three. Mm -hmm. So every single day, that person is focused on how do I get a deal today? How do I find a deal today? Mm -hmm. And what I want them to hear from you is you've built something that has longevity and life because you're patient with it. Some of the people you talk Mm -hmm. to are ready today, like, let's go. But others might be 30 days out, 60 days out. Does the story come to mind of one that's maybe a little further out? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I had somebody text me today. They were a client. I was introduced by an agent back in probably March timeframe. Okay. So <laughs> reached out, followed up. The realtor was actually selling the house they were renting. So they needed to go somewhere. Yeah. And I followed up and they were a difficult, challenging one to get a hold of, quite honestly. We proceeded, but it took many, many months to get there. And long story short, they were sort of qualified, not not fully qualified. And they decided to move to South Carolina. So they moved from Idaho to South Carolina. And that was probably after four or five months. So that's a perfect time to probably give up on them, right? I'm not licensed in South Carolina. Absolutely. They're out of my market. Um, But we didn't. I stayed in touch. And a part of that was with an automated uh, campaign. I have a great CRM. I recommend everybody do that. Nice. Right? There was some automation involved there, but essentially we, we didn't give up. There was no reason to give up. I just got a text this morning that they're coming back to Idaho 
probably this April. Oh my goodness. And, so they had moved to South yeah. Carolina and were renting and now they're moving back to Idaho to buy. Yeah. And that's eight months later with yeah. our state between you. Holy yeah. cow. And so the way that I look at that, if, if me following up and staying in touch with them in a very friendly way, like how's it going in South Carolina? What can we help with? Any questions on the market? Automated, right? A lot of automated things. If it doesn't oh, yeah. take a lot of my time or, or yeah. energy, then why would I ever let that person out of my database? Absolutely. There, there just isn't a reason. You know, I love it when a realtor calls calls me and says, Hey, I've got a client. They need to get pre qual today. They're going to be serious. We're going to make an offer today, tomorrow. That's fantastic. I love that client. Everybody does, but I need clients in March and in June and next November also. Absolutely. And if I water those seeds, as you mentioned now, those clients that are not ready now become those immediate clients That's right. in those future months. Yeah. Then I don't have to look for them later, right? They're already right. there. I've already built the rapport. They trust me. They know me. It just becomes so easy. It's just so much, it's so much easier to nurture somebody you're already in touch with than it is to find a new person. Yeah, it's funny. There's a guy that I interviewed down here in uh, Westlake Village where I live in Southern California years ago. I've known him forever. He, we, we've known of each other. He was in the master's coach program for a while with building champions. And I remember interviewing him and it was, it was a similar market to what we're in right now. He had reached out to me and wanted me to do a realtor event for him, for his, for his local realtors, but the market shifted. Right. And, and suddenly it was a refi market. And when I called back, he said, Oh yeah, forget that. Like right now I just, my phone's blowing up. And, and I, so I said, well, tell me more, like, let, you know, let's do an interview. I want to hear more about your story. Well, he's got, you know, like you, probably 10,000 people in his database. And his point was, why would I go out and try and sell somebody new when I've got people that are already sold on me? Like mm -hmm. they already know me. They already trust me. Yeah. So there's that guy. Then there's the guy, Lenny, that sold me insurance years ago because I responded to something. I'll bet this was 15 years ago. I clicked on something, you know, that I shouldn't have. Right. <laughs> and it led me into him and he was selling some kind of disability policy back in the day. And I wasn't thinking about it. I was young and healthy and who really cared. Right. But at some point, like he just never let go, man, he never mm -hmm. let go. And I finally bought a disability policy from him yeah. because we had never met, we had never spoken, but he was mm -hmm. following up professionally via email to your point, just like you do. So you guys, man, if you take nothing else from this, I hope you take number one, focus on building your database. Everybody is a prospect. That person that you just met at a fundraiser, that individual that you got into a conversation with at church, the, everybody is a potential prospect for you because everybody has a real estate story, right? Everybody has to live somewhere. Right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. They're ready to move up, move down, invest, buy, stop renting, mm -hmm. got a 33 year old that's getting ready to leave the house, whatever. There's yeah. something going on in their story. And if you can just engage with that story and forget about the single mindedness of, are you ready to purchase a home today? If you yeah. forget that and just create relationships and do what Mike has done by creating a system that allows you to follow up over time and an extended time, you'll be building a farm that will yeah. feed you and your family forever. Uh, yeah. Otherwise you're just pulling stuff off the shelf at 7-Eleven and that's only going to last for so long. You, you mentioned one of the most important aspects of my follow-up process and that's that it's not about what you want or need as the loan officer. That's not what it is, right? It's about what they need or want. Yeah, man. Help them get what they need or want. You will get what you Come need. Come on. Come on, preach. Yeah, little, and so Ziggler going there, man. It can't be a like a who do you know that wants to buy or sell real estate? It That's can't right. be that. That's not helping them. That's helping you. Just follow up in a very friendly way. I know a lot of people have the, you know, the drunk monkey saying, I can't make this call. I can't, I cannot do it. I'm bugging them. I'm interrupting their day. If you do it in a helpful, professional Absolutely. way, just, you know, and, and that's where the notes, previous notes are so important to know what their, what their objections were, what their life was about, what right. their goals were, because then you can continue to offer guidance and advice. Right now, there's a lot of questions about rates and the market and the economy. Those are perfect things to follow up on. Like, hey, did you hear about the rate decrease? Uh, are you concerned with what the Federal Reserve is doing? You know, whatever the question might be, it becomes about them and, and serving their needs and their curiosities. Absolutely. And then you're, you're not a hard salesperson. You're not That's a pushy right. salesperson. You're just helping them. It really yeah, is, and, isn't, isn't hard. That's how you show up. That That's mm -hmm. how I see you. You come across as that guy. I think people can feel that. 
It's a beautiful thing, man. So look, you, I think you have fired people up right now because you always fire me up. Like whenever we talk genuinely, you always fire me up. So I know that you've got people that are encouraged right now, motivated for years. When I did my interviews starting 30 years ago, I used to always ask, so what's the best way to, for people to follow up with you? I think these days it's pretty easy. Like if yeah. you just Google Mike Morrison, mortgage, you know, Boise in particular, you'll find him. I would encourage people to stay in touch with you, follow you on social. And I know you're open to chatting if somebody is open to that. So yeah. I, I dramatically appreciate your willingness to share, but you are so busy. There's so much going on in your world. It would be easier for you not to have gotten on that stage in Palm Springs. It would be easier for you not to spend this hour with me. And yet what you're, what you're doing by doing that is you're encouraging people. And I just, I hope that feels great to you because you're making a difference. It does. Yeah. I've had a, th thank you so much again for your help in uh, getting me on stage at sales mastery. And I, I want to thank My Todd pleasure. Duncan as well. That was, he runs an incredible event. If people haven't been there, they really need to go there. Uh, I took a lot so away good. from it. Yeah. It's so good, but I, I agree. Yeah. yeah. You guys are like, jot that down. Like for October, 2023, I'm sure the dates are out just, you know, Google it now, but put those dates in your calendar and start a, start a little fun, throw a little bit of money in every yeah. month if you need to. But I agree, man. I'd, I've never seen an event ever that has as much motivational power because you hear from so many different people. Like you hear mm -hmm. from Todd and Todd's great and he's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's all you need. But there was Mike Morrison and, you know, so many other, I don't, I don't know, man, there probably were 25 different people that I think you know, it was walked across 40. the stage. Yeah. Some some just some 40? amazing content and speakers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, make sure you go. All yeah. right, buddy. Thank you so much for sharing. I love your message. I am uh, fired up about the fact that more people have now been exposed to you and uh, might keep making a difference. And if there's ever anything I can do to serve you, you know how to find You're me. You're welcome. And anybody watching this, please reach out. I've, I've en actually enjoyed uh, uh, talking to people since the Sales Mastery event. A lot of people have reached out and I, I love to share this and, and uh, you won't be bothering me. So please reach out. Right on. Mike, thank you so much, buddy. You're welcome. Take care, bud.